the human sacrifice. What do you do when you're forced to choose between sacrificing your best friend or letting her kill you? Depression, social anxiety, crippling insecurity, and of course, the voice. My therapist keeps insisting that my only road to recovery is to open up about what happened to me, so here goes. This is the story of how I killed my best friend. We were just two freshman girls in high school, I can't believe it has been three years already. Riley and I used to be inseparable. I practically lived on her living room floor, went everywhere together, watched all the same anime, making a duet out of every theme song. We took all the same classes, even though she had to fail her math placement exam just to be with me. So when I heard her parents talking about summer camp, I basically just invited myself. Two months without her was unimaginable. I didn't even know who I was without her. Validating my dumb jokes. Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? Because it was dead. Why did the second monkey fall out of the tree? It was following the first monkey. My parents said okay, and I had never been more excited for anything in my life. We were going to spend the whole summer doing arts and crafts, making popsicle stick battleships and destroying other people's projects, telling campfire stories. Riley is terrified of witches for some reason, Waha, and playing sports. Okay, I could do without the sports, but either she would be on my team and we could just goof off in the back or I was playing against her and we could destroy each other. In a competition so brutal that would make the Spartans wince. On our first day there we took a group hike through the woods. The counselors were a pair of horny college freshmen who kept making awkward advances toward each other, which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Less supervision means more freedom. So when I dared Riley to eat some mushrooms, we found growing by the trail there was no one paying enough attention to stop her from eating a fistful. I don't know if that makes me a bad person by itself, but I was definitely a bad person for laughing at her when she got the shits. She walked like a penguin with hemorrhoids for a while, pretending it was no big deal. Before long, she couldn't take it though and had to go off in the woods. I kept watch for her and the rest of the troop went on without us. Riley kept worrying someone was going to see her though, and she went way farther off the trail than she needed to, where she found the circle of branches in a little clearing, the place where she died. I can't do this. I don't want to write this. I don't want to relive how those branches looked covered in her blood. I don't want to hear the voice. It hasn't stopped calling for me since. Please, let it stop after I've gotten this off my chest. By the time Riley finished her business, which was way longer than either of us expected, the rest of the troop had gone too far to catch up with. I remembered that they were taking the same trail from the hilltop, so I figured we'd just wait here for them to pick us up on the way back. Riley didn't want to stay around the circle, but that made me want to hang out here even more. It took a while of teasing and prodding before she admitted it looked like a witch circle. I guess her family had it. Long history of which related incidents. Riley's mother was thoroughly convinced she was cursed after a confrontation with some old crone and her great-grandmother was actually burned at the stake. While we waited, Riley told me about how someone in her family was accused of witchcraft practically every generation since they got here from Germany like 200 years ago. She was obviously still feeling sick from the mushrooms and feeling embarrassed for being left behind. The circle made her uncomfortable and it was starting to get darker so I did what any best friend would do. I started making weird voices to try and freak her out. I didn't really know what sound witches make so I settled for some general cackling a couple mentions of turning her into a toad and of course using her eyes for my latest potion. To her credit, she remained pretty cool about it, and even started joining in with me to see who could make the best cackle. The look on her face though, it's burned into my memory. Those wide, strained eyes, the tremor under her skin, the tautness of her face pulled so tightly it looked like it would snap. Because when she had stopped cackling, 
the sound didn't stop. It kept laughing and laughing, growing deeper with every iteration. We'd been goofing off for so long, we didn't notice how late it had gotten. The sun was setting, and the rest of the campers should have been back by now, but it wasn't them. Making the sound, there was a figure standing in the middle of the circle, kneeling on the ground, enshrouded in a thick cloak like what a medieval monk might wear. The sound was coming from it. Didn't care whether it was a joke or prank. We weren't sticking around. We gave each other one look. That's all we ever needed to know what the other was thinking and bolted out of the circle. At least we would have, but the branches seemed to have a mind of their own. Something grabbed our ankles and we both fell trying to climb out of the circle. I turned around and the cloaked figure was standing over us. You know what happens next. You know I sacrificed Riley in that circle. It was fast, but it wasn't clean. Even a pocket knife can cut through to the jugular, but it still took her a long time to bleed out. The part one haven't told you, the part my therapist says I need to tell you, is that the witch didn't make me do it, chose to kill her. I was screaming. Riley wasn't. She was always the one with a phobia about witches. It was stupid for me to be more scared than her. I tried to scramble up again, but this time it was Riley who dragged me back down. The cloaked figure removed its hood, but underneath it was only one of the camp counselors. An awkward teenage boy. Hey, I really got you, didn't I? He said, laughing in a good natured way. Not at all like that deep laughter that wouldn't stop. She guess that'll teach you not to sneak off on your own dot. Sh but the cloak, I managed. She got it from the art shed to scare you, he replied. We're going to bedazzle it for our camp mascot later this week. Cool, man. On you too. Let's head back. Everyone was worried, Dot. There were tears in my eyes. I was so relieved, but even more embarrassed. Great first day of camp and we were all ready. Going to be the butt of everyone's joke. I figured Riley must have been even more embarrassed than me though because her wide eyes were still bulging from her head. Her skin looked as pale as death in the fading light. I this place, it's calling to me. I heard it laughing, she said, hardly above a whisper. Hey, all right, chokes over, he replied. I just wanted to get back to the camp before everyone was talking about us. Shh, come on girls, let's not miss the bonfire, the counselor was, climbing over the branches. Shh, don't you hear it? Don't you hear it laughing? Riley asked, turning on the counselor. A nice try, but you can't scare me. I'm the one who. He was dead before he knew what hit him. One of the branches shot straight through his heart. It lifted him from the ground, growing like a tree would if it were sped up ten thousand times. More branches rose from the circle, impaling him one after another. I can still hear the snap as they break off. Under his skin, I was screaming again. I couldn't help myself. Riley was laughing. That same deep laugh which wouldn't stop. A moment before. I'm waking up, Riley said. Hey, the sacrifice will feed me. But I'm still hungry. I'm waking up, Dot. The branches kept lifting the counselor's body higher off the ground. The whole forest was starting to come alive around us. Everything was shaking. The moon was getting brighter. Birds stopped singing, and one by one began dropping dead. From the branches, Riley's face was aging years every second. Her eyes were pools of blackness. Her skin was wrinkled and coarse. And the branches, the branches were coming at me. That's when I slit her throat. I didn't know what else to do. Dug my little knife into her. I wish she had screamed or fought me or thanked me for stopping her. But as soon as I did, the forest settled back down, the branches suspending the counselor broke, and he fell back into the circle. It was just me, covered in her blood, and the two dead bodies beside me. When I got back to camp, I told everyone that the counselor tried to rape my friend, that he was the one to kill her, and that I killed him with a branch. I couldn't tell them the truth, and I especially couldn't tell them what Riley said to me as I plunged my little knife into her throat. She, I am not this fragile body. You will continue to feed me and 
I will still wake up Doc. The voice hasn't stopped since then. Keeps telling me to go. Places. To do things to people. Horrible things I wouldn't dream. Of doing. And I just keep ignoring it but it's getting harder and. Harder. It's so hungry. I can't stop it forever. So I'm doing what? My therapist told me to do. I'm writing down the whole truth. And I'm praying that it will leave me alone. I don't want to die. Like she died. I don't want to kill like she killed. I miss Riley. Miss my friend. I just want this to be over. Countdown to the beast. Your countdown will begin as soon as you finish this story. The clock struck 12, and I was fast asleep. From the darkness of my mind woke a strange echoing laughter, ringing out as a bell chiming its 12 tolls. Rhythmic laughter, hollow laughter, like a broken toy which mimics life in macabre falsity. Why are you laughing? I asked the darkness of my dream. I laugh because I am afraid, it says, the laughter unabated. By the words, sh when I'm afraid, I scream. I told it in a matter-of-fact tone. Hey, you're only supposed to laugh when something is funny, Dot. Sh but I daren't let him know that I am afraid, and so I laugh, cackled the voice. Sh what is there to be afraid of? I asked. A lots of things. I'm afraid of how people will remember me, and I'm afraid that they don't anymore. I'm afraid of noises, without forms, and forms without noise. I'm afraid of pain, without a source, because it can't be stopped. I'm afraid of a source without pain, because it means that I'm already gone. But most of all, I'm afraid of time. What is frightening about time? A nothing, so long as it's there. But I'm afraid of time running out. I'm afraid of 11. So I laugh. The voice trembled. I the number 11. I am quite mystified. What about that? Makes you afraid? Hey, I am afraid because it isn't 12. I'm afraid because 12 is gone forever. I'm afraid because he's already here, the beast, who devours time. Who is here? I asked in alarm. I could still hear the laughter. When I woke up, I don't know which was more unsettling, thinking I was still dreaming or realizing that I was the one, laughing. The sun was bright though, flooding my little room. Through the window my mother was opening. Uh, you must have had a very funny dream to laugh like that. Didn't want to wake you, but it's time for school. Dot. Sh how early is it? I asked blearily, sitting up in bed. Ash ten you normally get up, she said clearly. I ten? What? I'm already late. Why did you let me sleep so long? I sprang from bed and began flinging through the clothes on the floor, looking for something clean to wear. Sh what are you rushing for? She said, laughing. I said, when you normally wake up, it's only seven now. Take your time, get dressed, the eggs will be ready in a few minutes. He laughed to see me frozen in confusion with one leg half stuffed into my trousers and left the room. There is something I didn't like about her laugh right then. It seemed too loud and forced, too artificial. I shrugged and dressed leisurely in a slightly used t-shirt and heavily used jeans, gathering up my spread of books and pens left out for homework the night before. I came downstairs presently and sat down at the kitchen table, rubbing my eyes. My younger sister was already sitting there, glancing disinterestedly through the paper as she looked for comics. She was two years younger than me in fourth grade, sitting cross-legged in her chair with hair bunched up into pigtails which bounced when she spoke. The smell of eggs was familiar and comforting, and I could hear the bacon sizzling along beside it. A newspaper off the table, mother said, steering the heavily laden plates into place. Sh anything happened today? I asked my sister Clara as she folded the paper and tucked it away. Sh nine, she replied distinctly. Sh what? E I said no. Can't you hear? I know. You said nine. I heard you say nine dot. Sh wake up, idiot, she replied, adding a conspiratorial wink. Sh children be good. Now eat up before the bus comes. Mother said, sitting down beside us. A hey, mom. What happens when time runs out? My sister asked. Mother innocently between mouthfuls. I dropped my fork laden with eggs and it rattled to the floor in the sudden silence. Sh time doesn't run out, 
dear. Goes on forever, Dot. Eh, but, I mean if it did. What would happen? Clara persisted. Pushed my chair back and kneeled down to retrieve my fork. Listening intently. Joel, I suppose nothing would happen. We'd all just sort of be stuck, wouldn't we? Nothing would happen forever. Eat up. I'm going to go wake your father. Mother stood and glided from the room. But I didn't notice her leave. I don't know. How? But Clara knew about my dream. Why the hell would you ask that? I demanded. A ringing. Echo of laughter danced along the back of my brain. And I shivered involuntarily. Sh eight don't know, she said. Shuffling her eggs about her. Plate. Sh what? Hey, I said I don't know. She snapped. Sh what's wrong with you? Today? Then after a pause, she added. E, I suppose it's because time is running out. I just wanted to know what will happen. Then, I don't think mother is right though. Do you know what I think will happen? She looked directly at me with wide and curious eyes. I know, and I don't care, I replied. A, I think she ignored me, speaking as though to herself, E, I think that when our time runs out in this waking world, we become the one in the dream dot. What do you know about my dream? What happened to you? I asked. But that doesn't seem so bad to me, she said. I still wide. I shifted slightly as though to stand, and her eyes did not follow me. She spoke on as though completely unaware of my presence. When we're in the dream, we get to be the one who laughs. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? Even if we're afraid, we'll still get to laugh. Dot. Sh -im -im -im. I'm starving. I heard my father's voice from the hall. Sh is that freshly cooked bacon? Smells like seven. Sh like heaven. I mumbled to myself. He said it smells like heaven. Dot. A no, he didn't. It. My sister giggled quietly in a sing song voice. I leapt to my feet and confronted her, but she was now focusing on her plate once more and showed no signs of continuing her thoughts. This wasn't making any sense. Time can't run out, and dreams are just dreams. Clara was playing a game. She liked games. She liked to tease me. But how does she know of my dream? I shook it away and ran from the room. Didn't matter. I just had to get out of here. It was gonna be a normal school day, with lunch at 11.30, gym in the afternoon, and music after that, and nothing was strange at all. In a matter of seconds, I was standing on the street corner, one shoe untied, hair uncombed, teeth unbrushed, and a stinging wind bringing me back to reality. I laughed at how silly I was being, and laughed again to think what my sister would say if she knew how scared I had been. Then I laughed a third time because I couldn't stop and a fourth, because I noticed the laughter rang out in short, evenly spaced bursts, like the ringing of a bell. I laughed a fifth time and then a sixth, and the sweat began to form on my forehead. I couldn't stop. I clasped my hands over my mouth, but my body was shaking so badly I couldn't contain myself, gasping for breath. Seventh ringing laughter escaped me. Each was spaced perfectly with perfectly consistent duration and the same hollow ring which resounded like the creature in the darkness of my sleep. The next I knew, I was sitting on the cold sidewalk, looking down at my untied shoe. Clara had just left the house, perfectly neat and ordered with her pink backpack zipped tight and slung over both shoulders. She was looking down at me and smiling. Why are we still at seven? She asked innocently. Good then. You'll still be here on the bus. I hate sitting alone. Dot. Why how? I gasped the clean cold air into my lungs that the dark laughter had denied me. Did you dream about the creature laughing in the darkness too? She don't be silly, she said. A hey, two people can't have the same dream dot. I then how do you know about time running out? She looked down at me and smiled sweetly because I was the one laughing. It got me the night before last that I stared at her in blank wonderment. Something was wrong. Her smile kept stretching wider. I swear I've never seen her show that many teeth before. Then she turned away, and I rubbed my eyes. Faded yellow school bus rolled into view, bumping and 
clattering down the road of our neighborhood which was strewn with potholes. The two Mumford boys who lived nearby were just jogging up the sidewalk now to join us. Ish, I told you we'd be on time, said the first. Told you I could. Hear the bus from a mile off. All the bumps in the road make it rattle like crazy dot. And I wish they would six those, said the other. It's hard to sleep when it's jumping around like that. Eh, he meant fix those, Clara giggled, offering her hand down to me to help me stand. Eh, shut up, I said, batting her hand away and standing on my own. Eh, you're full of shit and lies, so shut up, Dot. The Mumford boys started chuckling next to me and I could hear them whispering to each other. Sh, did you hear what he just said? Eh, I know. Eh, and you too. Shut the fuck up. I roared at them. Eh, cowered as though I would hit them. Why would I hit them? I've never hit anybody before, but I can't deny that I wanted to. The feeling burned in my hands and chest. I wanted to beat them bloody. I unclenched my fists and took a deep breath. The bus stopped and the Mumford boys ran inside like they were trying to get away from me. I got on and searched for Louise, moving to sit beside her. The seat next to her had always been empty for the last few weeks and this way I wouldn't have to sit next to my sister. There was Louise, her slouched, lumpy shape, her downcast face hidden in the same hoodie she always wore. I never thought I'd be so relieved to see her. Clara stuck out her tongue as she passed me, sitting in the back with the other fourth grade girls. Louise was just staring out the window so I didn't even have to talk to her, but I wanted distraction from all these unbidden thoughts. I stared at the back of Louise for a full minute without her turning to look at me. How are Louise? I asked her hoodie. I five. Five. Fine. I'm fine. She mumbled. So much for getting my mind off of it. She drew her hood a little tighter around her face. Why did you correct yourself? Do you know that you said five first? I asked. Hey, yeah. Don't know why dot. She you too then. I exclaimed. Well, other people have been counting for me. I haven't been. Did you have the dream? E, I don't know. I guess. Time is running out, she mumbled, still not facing me. The bus had begun its lurching rattle towards school. And that was a long time ago, though, Dot. I, what do you mean? Time already ran out, I asked. Well, not for everyone. Did for me, though, Dot, she finally turned towards me, and she was grinning. I had never seen Louise smile before. Her face was fat and dumpy, but her smile was huge. The longer I stared, the wider it got, until it looked as though it would split her whole head in two. I leapt into the aisle, and the next lurch of the bus sent me to my knees. There I counted down weeks ago, Louise said, but her smile remained fixed and motionless as the words came out. They started to stand over me and I scooted away along the floor not, taking my eyes off her. Ayo, oh, me too. I heard another voice pipe up, Wilson, one of the fifth graders. He was standing a few rows back and I watched in horror as his smile continued to grow. I was afraid at first, but I'm not anymore. He doesn't like it when you're afraid. Now I just laugh. Dot. You can't let him see you being afraid, Louise said from behind. Is someone on the floor back there? Yelled the bus driver. Should get off the floor. Get to your seats. God's sakes, we're almost there. Dot. Yes, sir. Replied Louise and Wilson in perfect unison. Clambered back into my seat, not looking at either of them. What happens if he sees you're afraid? I whisper out of the corner of my mouth. Louise laughed. I looked at her now and saw her mouth opening so wide that it stretched from ear to ear opening up, large enough to swallow my whole head. Her teeth and tongue were still normal size though and they were so disproportionate to the swollen mouth that the teeth looked like. Tiny splinters hammered into her gums while her tongue lolled, about disgustingly in the back like a shriveled up slug. Wilson gave an identical peal of laughter from behind, and I turned to see his mouth stretching gruesomely wide as well. Then Clara? My poor sister Clara laughed in turn, but I refused to look at her. 
I couldn't bear to see her like that. The fourth toll. I knew it was coming, but I couldn't stop. Myself. I took a deep breath of air and clasped my hands over. My mouth. But I felt the trembling well up inside me. It shook so. Violently that I was afraid I would literally rip apart if I didn't. Let it out. I felt seams burning into my skin as it stretched from. Within and bright red lines shot down my arms where the blood swell up underneath. I screwed my eyes tight and gave in, laughing the fourth toll. She good for you. I heard Clara say before me. She keep laughing. Then he won't know dot. Sh three are here. Now get out you little rascals. Dot. Whatever you're playing at back there and get out the bus. Driver called as the rickety vehicle pulled to a stop. The doors slid open and all the children filed out, bustling against each other and talking and laughing as though nothing happened. Turned to Louise who was looking at me with dead blank eyes, her mouth having recovered its old shape. Sh what are you staring at? She asked in monotone. Stop. Blocking the way and let me out dot. I stepped aside quietly and she shoved past me. My heart was racing. I felt sweat trickling along my neck, snaking its way down my back. I filed out of the bus, wordless. Clara stepped past me, smiling sweetly. I didn't say anything. If I opened my mouth now, I was afraid that I would scream, or worse yet, I would laugh again. I mustn't let him know that I'm afraid, or he'll take me too. A nausea swelled up inside me, and I stepped aside from the others to take a few deep breaths, hands on my knees. I can't scream. I won't. I can't. He won't take me like that. Eh, you know, we all think that, Clara says from behind. Jumped. Hey, some of us don't even make it to one. They get so. Terrified before that he goes ahead and takes them early dot. She won't take me. I'm not afraid, I said belligerently. Hey, the countdown will hit zero and I still won't be afraid and then it will all be gone, right? I'll wake up or realize it was all a joke. And I'll laugh and oh, I won't laugh, no more laughing. But it'll all be over. I'll have passed, right? Hey, I don't know, she said thoughtfully. I don't think anyone has ever passed before. I thought I would, but then he came and I was afraid to dot. I afraid to? Or two? Two or two? I shouted at her, both sounding the same. Other children began to stare at me and point, but my voice kept getting louder. Sh two or two, two or two. She laughed, not a hollow laugh, but a good natured one. See, you on the other side, she said, and turned to go inside the building. Everyone else was inside now. If I walked in, then someone would say the final countdown and he would come and take me. That was it. If I stayed out here completely alone, then there would be no one to say the words. I just had to sit out here until it had all passed over. I just had to sit out here until I woke up. I walked alone to the playground, chill breeze lifting with the warming sun. I saw the kids running about the hall through the window, but they wouldn't find me. No one would find me out here. I was conscious of how loud my footfalls were on the wood chips by the swings, so I turned and hurried to the pavement as quickly as I could. But my heart, my heart was beating so loudly I was sure someone would hear it. Someone would find me and say the words, and it would be over. Tried my chest with my hands, but it wouldn't be still. Goodamit, e. Wished it would stop beating. I pounded my chest in. Aggravation, wondering if I could find something sharp to silence it. I didn't think about it as killing myself then. I just wanted the damn thing to stop. I sat down on the curb, my hands clawing through my hair in. Aggravation. Maybe my ears. Maybe I could pull my ears off. And I wouldn't hear the final count. It wouldn't work if I couldn't hear it, right? He wouldn't be able to take me then. Grabbed my right ear with both hands and pulled so hard I thought it must come off. But then I cried out from the pain and let go. Had someone heard me? Would they come? My face felt so hot against the cool wind. My body was trembling and I began to cry. No. Someone will hear. But the trembling built to shakes and the shakes into convulsions and before I knew it, 
I was sobbing. Out loud. I couldn't be alone forever. I had to make this stop. Wiped away my tears angrily and stood. Defiantly, I yelled into. The wind. Tuan. Are you happy now? I want to wake up. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 0. Did you hear me? I heard the howling of the wind getting louder behind me. This was it. He was coming and it would all be over. I said zero. The roar behind me was deafening. At last I couldn't hear my own heart anymore. L12. I shouted again. I said a 12. And then I began to laugh. I felt a splitting pain in the sides of my mouth. And I laughed even harder, knowing it was coming. Blood began gushing down my face as my maw distended horribly, and the laughter kept ringing out in even bursts. Rhythmic. Laughter. Hollow laughter. Like a broken toy. You might ask me why I laughed then and I would tell you it was because I was afraid. You might not understand, but you will. I laughed because 12 was gone forever. I laughed because I was afraid of 11. Anger management. I hate Clive. His smug, lopsided grin. His greasy comb over. His horn-rimmed glasses. I don't think I'd break if I saw him crossing the street. In fact, I fantasize about it every time I sit down in his office. I third time this week, huh? He asked me. Shit's not my fault, I said. AI gave Robert every chance to back down. He's the one who should be in here, not me. Dot. She's not the one who punched a dent in someone's car. Dot. Of all the things I hate about Clive, nothing compares to his title as human resources director. I wonder if he ever had sex, or if inconveniencing my life was the only thing he needed to get off. AI apologized already. Okay, can I go back to work now? AI can't just keep letting these incidents slide, Clive said, pressing his glasses into his face like he was trying to glue them on. Hey, this is going in my quarterly report to management. Dot. My fantasy of hitting him with the car now included a section where I back up once or twice. I clenched my fists, took a deep breath, and counted off a full 10 seconds in my mind. Getting written up would jeopardize my shot at the branch manager position. I didn't waste four years of my life in this shithole just to stay in sales. As much as it hurt, I was going to have to suck up to this beanbag masquerading as a human being. Ah, you're right, you're absolutely right, I replied. I was in the wrong there. Even though he was in my parking spot, I shouldn't have punched his car. I know I have a problem and I've started taking an anger management class. It's going to help. And this won't happen again. So please give me one more chance before you report it. Dot. A good for you, buddy. Dot. Buddy, call me that again and I'll jab my pin in your neck. Buddy, I smiled. And I'll tell you what, he added. She give me the number of the place you're meeting at, and I'll check in with them. They think you're showing signs of improvement. I'll keep this out of your report. Dot. Shit. Now I'll actually have to go to a class. My mouth hurt from smiling so hard. A hey, sure thing, buddy. I said, I don't have the number with me, but I'll bring it in tomorrow. Dot. I opened the door and immediately shut it again. Couldn't be the anger management class I found online was incense burning in there and drums like some kind of freaking hippie circle. The door opened and an old Asian man blended into the doorway. I felt a certain tranquility just from looking at him. He wore immaculate ceremonial robes like some sort of priest and his snow white hair cascaded down his back in gentle waves. He bowed low to me, his body curving with a supple grace which utterly belied his apparent age. Hi, is this where the United Way Anger Group meets? Welcome, kind sir. My name is Akari, and it is so good to see a man such as yourself so in command of his own destiny. Won't you please come in? There weren't any corny brochures with perfect models. Saying anger gives you ulcers. No dolls for me to be nice to, no. Punching bags to vin on. I don't really know what I was expecting, but it definitely wasn't this. 
Hey, the website said 6.30. Where is everyone? I asked. There weren't even any chairs in the small room. Two. Cushions were placed on the ground between a pair of bonsai trees, and Akari sat down on one to face me. She know others, only you. I do not need groups because those who seek my help must only ask once to be saved. I don't need saving, okay? I was starting to feel uncomfortable. The website looked legit, but this guy seemed more like a cultist than a therapist. What if he didn't have the right accreditation or something? I could be wasting my time. Should I handle my own issues just fine? I added. All I need is for you to talk to the HR director at my work and tell him whatever. Tell him I'm master of my destiny or something. Already paid online. So are we good? We are far from good, for we are each imperfect beings, inflicted with the human condition. Do not worry though, you will soon be better. Dot. I check my watch. Tight smile. Can someone sprain a muscle from forcing too many of those? It felt like it. I sat cross-legged on the available pillow and tried not to swear at the awkward position. Sh fucking shit. Dot, oops. Oh well, he already knew I had an issue. He saw the don't you have a chair? Akari just smiled, but his was nothing like my smile. It bubbled straight up from the warmth in his heart. It was patient and wise, almost as though he was reading straight from the divine playbook of the universe and knew everything was following the script. Do you know why there is suffering? Akari asked. Measured tone made me pretty sure he wasn't talking about the lack of chairs because we're all evil sinners who deserve it, I asked. I no one deserves to suffer, Ikari replied, but we do, because we each carry a demon in our hearts. Anger, jealousy, hatred, misery, these are ways we feed our demon, do. You know what happens when we fed it for too long? I shook my head. My demon must be pretty full by now. Ikari leaned in close to me and whispered, gobble, gobble, gobble. It eats us right up. The way he said it made me shudder. It was like he was satisfying a greedy pleasure just from speaking the words. I felt immense relief when he settled back into his own cushion before continuing. She eventually, our demon becomes stronger than we are, and it gets to be the one on the outside. Who we are, who we were. That gets locked away. And unless someone tricks the demon into eating kindness, gratitude, patience, and other virtues, we will never become strong enough to wrestle the demon back. Down dot. As so how do we stop feeding the demon? I asked. If you take away its food, Akari produced a small wooden jewelry box, every inch of which was engraven with Japanese lettering. I and you put it in here. Have a bad feeling? Write it down on a piece of paper. Slip the paper through this hole in the top. Angry at someone? Give it to the box. It won't be long. Before your demon begins to starve, every problem can be solved by simply putting it in the box. And that's it? I won't be angry. I was trying really hard not to laugh at him. Ish and I shall tell Mr. HR that you are all better. Ikari smiled and handed me the box. Show only one more thing. You must not ever open the box or gobble gobble gobble. Your demon will feed. Again, Dot. What a load, right? But that was easier than sitting through a bunch of dumb meetings. I would have just thrown the box out right then, but Akari might check it later to see the notes I'd put in. When I got home, I figured I'd just get it all out of the way at once so I wouldn't have to think about it. I grabbed a notebook and tore out a couple dozen pieces of paper. The feeling when I'm stuck going five miles per hour on the freeway, slip, clives everything. I hate him so damn much. Slip. People who kick dogs. I wish they'd kick Clive instead. Slip. The more I wrote, the more ideas began flooding into my head. Everything I could think of that pissed me off started cramming into the box. People who steal parking spaces. Fuck you, Robert. The taste of orange juice after brushing your teeth. Every girl who has ever given me that, it's not you. It's me. Shit. The box didn't look that big, and I expected it to only take 10 minutes to fill. Three hours later though, I had emptied an entire notebook 
and still couldn't feel the paper inside. But do you know what I did feel? Like a motherfucking Buddha. Seemed absolutely ludicrous that any of those things have ever bothered me before. Or Clive, just trying to do his job. Why did I have to give him such a hard time? And Robert should have my parking spot near the door. He was older than me, and I didn't mind the exercise. How in the world did I get to the point of punching a dent in his car? I've never slept so well in my entire life. I'm usually tense and unable to find a comfortable position, but five minutes after I lay down, I was sound asleep. I did have one troubling dream, though. There was a soft light coming from inside the box on my night table. In my dream, I got up to reach for it, but then I heard something inside of it scream like a man who has been pushed past the edge of breaking. I opened the box to see what was making the noise, and then gobble gobble gobble. I woke up to the freshest, most miraculous morning I could remember. The last two weeks were perfect for me. I worked tirelessly, unfettered by the daily aggravations which I used to spend half the day obsessing over. I started bringing the box to work just in case something came up in the day, and things always came up. No point in risking my promotion, right? The box went everywhere with me. The sound of dry erase markers on a whiteboard slip. Suddenly the morning meeting was bearable again. I hated anyone hear that. Mr. Ellsworth turned away from the whiteboard to address the assembly. Something like a scream, a collective shrug, and sip of coffee. I thought I'd heard it too. Though, the moment I slipped the paper in, there had been a soft flash of light and an echoing scream. Clients who think they know how to do my job better than I do slip. Having to wear a tie all day, I could strangle someone with this tie. There it was again. It started out as a low moan, but rose into a gurgling scream after I had slipped the second note in. I glanced up to see Clive standing outside my cubicle. Sh what? What are you doing? What do you want? Just looking at him made me agitated. Sh I wanted to let you know that I called Mr. Akari, and he said, you showed a complete turnaround. As long as nothing happens before tomorrow, your report is going to be clean. Congratulations, buddy. Dot. When people I hate call me buddy, Clive again. The box screamed. It was louder this time. Clive had already gone, but someone was going to hear it if I kept this up. Was the second note I'd had to use for Clive too. Guess some. Hatred is too deep to extract all at once. Worse still, the moaning continued even though I wasn't putting anything in now. It sounded like the lamentations of a doing man. I shut the box in my drawer, but I could still hear it groaning away, then a soft rattle. I opened the drawer and saw the box trembling as a frightened animal. Well shit, I couldn't just throw it away. I had to get my anger out somehow, or that promotion was gone. Couldn't keep it here either though, because someone was going to. Hey, what's that sound? Is that the pipes? I didn't answer them. I didn't look at them. Ivalkiet fast. Through the building with the box in my pocket, the warehouse, it's always noisy down there. If I hide the box, then no one will hear it, and I can still get down to slip a note in if I need to. The sound of forklifts backing up. The restaurant which always gets my lunch order wrong. It was 4.30 now. Only half an hour to go and I was in the clear. I was walking down to the warehouse to slip my last note of the day into the box. Mr. Ellsworth keeping people till 5 even when there's nothing to do. I opened the crate of printer paper where I'd stored the box and reached around. Odd, I usually could hear the screaming when I was this close to it, especially now since the machinery was all quiet after the warehouse workers left for the day. It wasn't there. I practically dove into the crate, but my box wasn't anywhere. It was only half an hour though, right? Could make it happen, but no. Without the box, the anger would still be there. Even if I did get the promotion, I'm sure Ellsworth would notice sooner or later and bump me back down. It wasn't fair. I'd put in the work. I was better than any of them. Wasn't right for me to keep getting passed over just because. Scream. There it was. What started out as a horrible sound 
now filled me with relief. It was the next sound which I dreaded. More. What in God's name are you doing in there? I pulled myself out of the crate to face Clive. He was holding. My box in his hand. And it was open. She give it back. Now. I snapped. It's mine dot. But he was reading my notes. Those were personal. He had. No right to. E is this some kind of joke? Clive asked. Why is my name in? Here? And such rude language. E you want language? Give me back my fucking box dot. My last note of the day was crumpled up in my hand. I was seeing red. I wanted to grab him by the throat and, but no. Needed that promotion. I couldn't lose it now. James sorry, Cleve. It was just an assignment from anger. Management class. It's supposed to be confidential, so give it back. This doesn't need to change anything with your report dot. Jim, I report? Clive practically shrieked. You're still worried about your promotion? You aren't going to have a job at all after this. If this is how you really think, then we have no place for you. I punched him across the face. I didn't want to, but I couldn't stop myself. All the little frustrations and pent up anger from the past two weeks were flooding back. I hit him for every day. This company has stolen from my life for every promotion, which passed me over and for every lonely night I sat at home. Too tired from work to go out. I pummeled his face into a pulpy mess and still couldn't get enough. The box was screaming like a banshee, convulsing on the floor, where Clive had dropped it. I couldn't tell how much of the blood on my knuckles was his and how much was mine and I didn't care. As good as it felt to be at peace with myself, this felt better, at least for a little while. Until Clive stopped moving, I dropped him back to the warehouse ground. The screaming, it was driving me crazy. I tried to stuff the scattered papers back into the empty box, but they wouldn't fit anymore. They spilled out over the ground, covered in my bloody fingerprints. How did I let this happen? What would Akari have done? He said any problem could go away if I put it in the box. Well shit, Clive was a problem and now he was going in a box, but that only made things worse. I stuffed his body and the bloody papers into one of the warehouse crates, mopped up as much of the blood as I could, and ran. Shh, open up. Open up, old man. I was back at the anger. Management class. If this was anyone's fault, it was Akari's. He must have known what the box did or he never would have given it to me. He must know how to make things right. He had to. The door was unlocked. So I went in. Akari was sitting on his cushion across from a middle-aged woman. I didn't want to involve anyone else in this, so I waited in the corner for her to finish. She handed a box which looked just like mine to Akari and thanked him. She was so grateful. It changed her life. Well, good for fucking her, because it ruined mine. Sh please have a seat, Akari said after the woman had gone. She was opened. I blurted out. She not by me, somebody else, and they're dead now. This isn't my fault, so you gotta help me. Fix this dot. I I understand, he replied gravely. Then he leaned in real. Close. So close I wanted to hit him, but I held myself back. And he whispered. A gobble 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 dot. I actually pushed him back into his seat. She don't give me that. Shit. You must know what happens. Why do you do this to people? A slow smile crept across his peaceful face, because I am so hungry, and all the hate they pour into their boxes returns to feed me, but you have already let your demon out, so what am I to eat now? The dead man in the warehouse was suddenly the least of my problems. Ikari was standing, although for some reason I never remembered watching him rise. Then he was behind me, not having touched the intervening space. I was absolutely speechless. I backpedaled until my back hit a wall. No, not a wall. He was behind me again, his arm wrapped around my neck, his long nails digging into the side of my throat. Sh when I look at you, all I see is a demon now, he said. All I can see is your selfish hunger dot. I didn't dare speak. Even swallowing was enough to push those nails deeper into my skin. 
I strained against his implacable grip with my hands, but with every motion the puncture became deeper. His arm constricted with the relentless, predatory pressure of a boa constrictor, and I was utterly helpless in its grasp. But your demon has already fed on my meal, so here is what you must do. Find those like yourself with anger burning in their hearts and collect it for me as I have done with you. Twice. Each month you will bring me a new box filled with hatred. Or, he didn't need to finish the sentence. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Pressure slackened just enough for me to nod. Maybe someday I will learn how to trick my demon. Someday I will learn how to be kind, even with this hatred burning in my chest, and I will lock him away. Someday I will learn to control my anger and not the other way around, but until then, would you like to stop feeding your demon? You only need to ask once for me to save you. The masked orgy. College is the time for experimentation. And no, I don't mean titrating sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid in chemistry. I mean forcing yourself to try new things, things that excite you, things that scare you. For how else are we supposed to discover who we are and what we're capable of without constantly pushing the boundaries of our reality? At least that's the excuse my boyfriend Mike came up with when he suggested a threesome. E sure, I replied. I really? Wow, okay. You're the coolest girlfriend ever. Sh what's the other guy's name? I knew what he meant, but I still enjoyed watching him choke. On the soda he was drinking, Mike had been talking a lot about Amy since she joined our lab group in anatomy. I was jealous at first, but after checking out the competition, I had to concede his point. It was hard not watching the supple curves of her body every day as she stripped her sweater over her head to put her lab coat on. I guess I was just relieved Mike was talking to me about it instead of doing something with her behind my back. He wanted me to broach the subject with her because a, it sounded less creepy coming from a girl. So I invited her to join Mike and I for drinks after class. Have you ever done anything with a girl before? I asked. Amy after our third beer. Mike spluttered in his drink and excused himself to go to the bathroom and I almost threw the rest of my glass after him. This was his idea. It wasn't fair. Making me do all the work. Luckily, there wasn't much work that needed doing. Hey, not yet, she replied, a smile playing around the corner of her lips. Two hours later, all of us were in my room trying to figure out how one person fits in a dorm room bed, let alone three. It was exciting for me, and I can only imagine how many flashing lights and alarms were blaring inside Mike's head. So I guess it was understandable that he spent most of the time focused on Amy. Besides, Mike and I were already comfortable with each other, so it was really just her that he felt the need to impress. Afterward, he said it wasn't the case, but I still remember spending way too long hanging out and watching them go at it. I even left to use the bathroom at one point without either of them noticing I was gone. I didn't want to get mad. I had agreed to this after all, and I hated the idea of being one of those infamous girlfriends who said one thing and did another. I just wanted to get even. Didn't help that he started acting cocky afterward as though that experience made him a big man or something. Even started pointing out particularly geeky looking freshmen and saying things like, e, I bet he's never even been with one, let alone two I. Although asking for another guy started out as a joke, I started pushing for it more seriously. I wanted him to feel what it was like to be jealous. I wanted him to appreciate what I had done for him and realize I was the only one of us who had the power to make it happen again. And yeah, if I'm being honest, maybe I even wanted to humiliate him a little so he'd go back to regular old Mike and drop this macho facade. We started having fights about it and the more he said no, the more one-sided our relationship seemed. I told Amy I thought I was gonna have to dump him she and I still hung out. Sometimes, although I never invited Mike when we did, told her it wasn't her fault, but she still felt guilty about getting between us, literally. That's why she came up with a solution. I know a place where they do it in a group. You'll get your kinks out, 
he'll have someone of his own to have fun with, and everyone is wearing a mask so nobody gets hurt. Dot. Big rubber animal masks. Didn't it get hot in there? Felt more. Then a little exposed wearing my stupid Mardi Gras mask I picked up at the dollar store on the way here. Everyone else's mask was hyper-realistic and covered their entire head, but they told me not to worry about it and just relax. Mike and I were just I initiates on a trial run anyway. If we decided this was our thing and we respected all of their rules and members, then they'd give us a full mask next time. First I stuck pretty close to Mike and we just fooled around with each other and watched. There was about a dozen people in total and the teeming mass of bodies was pretty damn intimidating to approach. Several of them had covered their bodies in some kind of paint or oil and they churned and writhed against each other with an almost animalistic intensity. Everywhere I looked, breasts were heaving, indiscriminate, hands clutched and pulled on skin, and bodies lunged hungrily at one another as though nourished by their carnal lust. I was about to call it quits and leave when a man in a panther mask pulled away from the others to approach me. His body was chiseled and slick with pain. Mike and I exchanged glances. Isn't this what I wanted? I pointed him in the direction of a leopard mask with fiery red hair spilling out beneath it. He hesitated, so I gave him a little shove. Nothing else this would be a shared experience we could laugh and bond over, and maybe we'd both be stronger for it. I still shuddered a bit when the panther man put his hand on my shoulders from behind, but his probing fingers expertly massaged down my back and I felt myself melt into his touch. Mike left shortly after that. We'd only been there about a half hour, and I was really, really starting to enjoy myself when I saw him staring at me and the panther man. Good, let him see. But then he just turned around and walked away and my satisfaction quickly drained. I followed him and we had another fight in the hallway while we were both still naked said he couldn't even look at me again after seeing me like that. Somehow the fact that he was more hurt and sensitive than me proved that he cared more about me than I did him, so it was over. He got dressed and left and I just stood there overflowing with frustration. I felt massaging hands caressing my shoulders again and I immediately felt the tension flowing out through them. If I was looking for a rebound to get past Mike, then I couldn't think of a more immersive, therapeutic one than this. I allowed the panther man to lead me back into the room. The lights had dimmed since I was gone, but a lot of the paint people wore was glowing in the dark. More hands grabbed me and I allowed myself to be swallowed up in the psychedelic dance of skin on skin, swirling colors and the growing moan which encompassed me. As the night went on, the lights continued to slowly dim colors grew brighter and the intensity of the sound and insistence of the sensation mounted into a crescendo of pleasure. I spent most of my time with the panther man, although I allowed myself to be passed from one person to the next. Without complaint, there was no embarrassment, no judgment, no jealousy, only the acceptance and triumph of our shared celebration of life. I was back with the panther man now, body flooded with gentle warmth and satisfaction. His hands were so powerful yet gentle, and his low moans resonated with my own as though we were a single being harmonized with itself. The thought of leaving here and never knowing who he was, perhaps never, even meeting him again, was more agonizing than I could have imagined. I felt an overpowering desire to look at the man, pressed against me, just for a second, just long enough to recognize him if we met again. I slid my hands up his neck and tenderly slipped the mask further up his face, but it wouldn't come off. I pulled harder and felt the strain of living fur beneath my fingers. He grunted in pain, or was that a snarl? And I pushed him off me. Suddenly every sound came to its height and the mounting carnal cacophony enveloping me became tainted with other sounds. Were those moans? Or was someone starting to howl? Then a yelping joined in. I thought it was a joke at first, but one by one the people began to bray, bark, 
hiss, or whatever other. Sound was appropriate to the mask they wore. The panther man knelt upon the ground and I saw his muscles coil as though preparing to spring. It was so dark that I could only see the parts of him covered in paint, and from a few steps away, he looked more like an abstract painting than a man. I ran toward the door, but tripped over a dark form along the way. A multitude of hands clung onto me in the shadows and then a paw with razor-sharp claws tore the skin on my outer thigh. I screamed and pushed onward, but the grips readily released me as though shocked I wasn't appreciating their touch. I made it to the wall, but I couldn't find the door. Panther Man crawled toward me on all fours. Some of the glowing paint was on his skin, but more of it was matted in. Patches of thick black hair on his body. I leaped along the wall looking for the door, ramming against another body and falling to the ground. The half panther was almost on top of me now, but I couldn't bear to look at him. Closed my eyes and screamed for all I was worth. E are you okay? What are you doing? I opened my eyes. The lights were on. Everyone was staring at me. The panther man with his chiseled human body was standing over me. He pulled on his furry ear, and I almost screamed again before seeing the rubber mask slide easily off. He was a handsome man, about thirty, with strong cheekbones and deep concerned eyes. I ran out the door and dressed in the hallway. The panther man started to follow me. I stop her. She's seen too much, he shouted, his voice a harsh, guttural snarl completely unlike the one he used a moment before. A woman in a sheep's mask held him back. She let her go. She'll come back when she's ready. The voice sounded familiar. Was that Amy? I didn't stay long enough to find out. As soon as my clothes were even halfway on, I ran. I'm not going back. I can't go back. But maybe I'll have to. Because I still need answers. I missed my period the next month. But I tried not to think back to that night. I was on the pill and they all had protection. Just to be safe, I got a pregnancy test, but it came up negative. I kept testing every month after that. Still nothing, but all the symptoms were beginning to show. I'm swelling up, I'm tired, all the time, and nauseous in the mornings. I got an ultrasound, but the doctor said he didn't see anything. It's just like a great, empty pit is growing inside of me. I got a few other scans, but nothing came up and the doctor just thinks it's a hysterical pregnancy which will pass on its own. I didn't know how to tell him I thought it was something else, just like I didn't know how to explain the claw marks on my outer thigh. I want to forget it ever happened, but it's hard when I keep feeling something scratching me from the inside. 